Hello, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and uh, let's talk about Jamaica Kincaid's short story, Girl. First, just a little biography uh, about Jamaica Kincaid. She was born in 1949, and she was raised in extreme poverty uh, on the Caribbean island of Antigua. And um, she was uh, born, actually, as Elaine Potter Richardson. Uh, that was her, her given name. Um, she uh, had a very difficult childhood. Her mother was a very harsh uh, uh, sort of a taskmaster, and that is something that comes up in a lot of her work, including in the short story Girl, which is certainly draws on her life experiences. I wouldn't call it autobiography, but it certainly comes from her real experiences, her real life. Girl was her first published story, and it appeared in 1978. Now, looking at the story, this is a very short story, and today we might call this um, something like a short, short story, or flash fiction, or micro fiction, uh, because it is just a very brief vignette. The first thing to notice about it is the narrative style. Now, remember, normally narratives are told either in the first person or the third person. So, as a reminder, what does that mean? What is first person? What is third person? Uh, well, to go back to your to grammar, fundamental basic grammar, first person is when you're speaking uh, from your own perspective. I, I do this, or we. Um, so, a short story like Sonny's Blues is a first person narrative because the narrator is in the story. Uh, you might think about video games, first person shooters, as they're called, where you are in, you are looking, seeing what the character sees, right? So, that's a first person. The other most common type of narrative is some version of third-person narrative. That is where someone is talking about he, she, they. The narrator is outside the story, someone observing and talking about the story, but not actually a part of it. And so a story like um, The Jewelry, that is a third-person narrative. Girl is in the very unusual and, and rather rare form of second-person narrative. Second person is when you're, when you're talking to you. And so what girl does is the narrator is talking to you, talking to the girl, talking to the primary character. So in a sense, it's a lot like a poem. Remember that a poem, as we talked about, is like a dramatic situation. It's one person speaking to another person. So in a way, this is much more like a poem than a short story. Because poetry, if we think back to poems that we've read like The River Merchant's Wife, A Letter, they ask you to take on two different roles. They ask you, one, to play the role of the person being addressed, the audience. So, for example, in a story like, uh, or a poem like A River Merchant's Wife, A Letter, we take the, the role, on the one hand, of the uh, river merchant himself, the person being written to. And we imagine, what is it that this woman, this, this wife, wants from me, the husband? And we also have to play the role of the wife, the speaker in the poem. The, and say, what is it that she wants? If she is writing this to her husband, what does she want from him? What is she experiencing? What is she feeling? And so forth. So Jamaica Kincaid's story, Girl, asks us to do a very similar thing. It asks us, on the one hand, to take the part of the girl being addressed. It's being told to us, wash the white clothes on Monday and put them on the stone heap. That is a voice telling you to do that. So we have to imagine what is it like to be this girl? How does it feel to be told this? What is our experience like if we are living in that position? And we also have to take the role of the speaker, the narrator, the person saying these things. What kind of person would tell their daughter or their granddaughter or their sister to do these things? What kind of person, what do they want? What do they believe in? What are their values if this is the direction that they're giving to the girl on what it means to be a girl? So what is the content of this story? What is this story about? Well, we have a speaker, or possibly speakers, talking to this girl and giving this girl instructions, orders, commands, telling her what to do. Wash the white clothes on Monday and put them on the stone heap. Wash the color clothes on Tuesday and put them on the clothesline to dry. Don't walk bareheaded in the hot sun. Cook pumpkin fritters in very hot, sweet oil. Soak your little cloths right after you take them off. When buying cotton to make yourself a nice plouse, be sure that it doesn't have gum on it because that way it won't hold up well after a wash. Soak salt fish overnight before you cook it. Is it true that you sing Benna in Sunday school? Always eat your food in such a way that it won't turn someone else's stomach, etc., etc., etc. So we've got a bunch of commands, and we can probably all 
identify to some extent with this girl, regardless of our, our gender. Uh, we've all been given orders by our parents or, or guardians, told, do this, don't do that. These are the chores you have to do. When you're out in public, behave in a certain way. Um, interact with people uh, who are your social superiors in a certain way. This is how you talk to elders. This is how you talk to your other family members. This is how you talk to your teachers. This is how you talk to boys. This is how you talk to girls, etc., etc. So we have this whole bunch of life advice. And even though the experiences of this girl are probably rather different from ours, this is um, someone growing up again on a, a poor Caribbean island, someone living a life with far less amenities and... Um, uh, uh, benefits that we have, uh, far less in terms of technology, but we can still identify with that sense of being a child, being told what to do. And so think about what is it like being a kid? What is it like being told to do this and do that by your parents? Um, there's probably a lot of different emotions that we feel. On the one hand, most of us want to please our parents or guardians. We want to, uh, we want them to think that we're good good people. We want them to love us. We want them to care for us. So we don't want to disappoint them. We want to do what they say. Um, some of us might also be afraid of our parents or guardians, um, whether we have a reason, an actual reason to or not. But many of us are afraid of our parents, afraid um, that they'll reject us, that they'll yell at us, that they won't that they won't love us, that they'll hit you, something like that. All these very real fears that, that many people have. Also, of course, when you're being told what to do over and over again, and this does come across as a litany, right? Imagine being just given a list of hundreds of things to do, one right after the other. It's tedious, and, it's, and it feels like pressure, and it feels so unfair that I have to do all these things, and you're telling me to do these things, and why don't you do it? Why do I have to do it? Um, so we can, I think, identify with that kind of frustration that the girl is feeling, as well as the desire to... Um, to please the parents. So it's kind of that, that internal conflict. And at the same time, as we notice, there's a, a couple of moments in this where um, the girl seems to speak back, right? Those couple lines in italics, when the mother accuses her or the voice accuses the girl of singing Benna in Sunday school, which is a, a folk style music, a popular music that's inappropriate for, for a church setting. Um, and she says, but I don't sing Benna on Sundays at all and never in Sunday school. And we've all been there. Your parents say, well, did you do this? Don't do these things. But I don't do that. I never do that. Right. That feeling of needing to defend yourself, of being put on trial unfairly by your parents who just don't understand what you've been through or who pick out tiny little uh, imperfections to make a big deal out of or who uh, even blame you for things that you didn't do. And, you know, you're innocent. Right. So all those sorts of um, frustrations, angers, uh, uh, sense of, of, of powerlessness, um, and at the same time, again, a kind of desire to, to fall in line, to do what you're supposed to do, to be a good kid. I think we can understand that as part of the experience of being this girl that's being spoken to. What might be harder for us to identify with is the voice of the narrator unless uh, unless you're a parent yourself. But if you haven't been a parent uh, or haven't been responsible for children, it might be harder to identify with the voice of this narrator. The first thing to think about is who is it that's talking? And is it just one person? Notice how there are many different types of advice given. There are uh, instructions about cooking. There are instructions about cleaning. There are instructions about romance, about how to behave around certain around uh, uh, men um, that you like or men that you don't like. Um, there's instructions about how to behave in public and how to carry yourself. And there's, of course, chastisements about doing things in, in uh, uh, the wrong way. And there's even warnings. There's even a sense of, I'm going to prepare you for your future life, right? Uh, this is how to catch a fish. This is how to throw it back a fish that you don't like, and that way something bad won't fall on you. This is how to bully a man. This is how a man bullies you. This is how to love a man, and if this doesn't work, there are other ways. So notice we go from this is how you catch a fish to this is how a man bullies you. This is what you need to be aware of and need to expect because one day you're going to be a wife and mother, and so you need to understand the way men can be and how to navigate that relationship. So we see all sorts of different types 
of instruction. And some of them are even um, very playful and seem uh, uh, like uh, little folk remedies. This is how to spit up in the air if you feel like it, and this is how to move quick so that it doesn't fall on you. So we think about who are saying these things. Is this all one voice? When you were a child, how many different people told you what to do? How many people, different people told you how to behave and told you what was expected of you and maybe chastised you, chastised you if you didn't ex behave in that way? Well, certainly maybe your mom and dad. Um, and depending on your gender, a lot of times people who are, if you're a girl, your mother might have been the one uh, more responsible for instructing you. Boys, oftentimes it's the father. Um, but your parents, also maybe your grandparents, if they're a part of your family, or uncles or aunts, right? All these extended uh, authority figures in your family who all give you advice and sometimes maybe even give you conflicting advice. Your mom tells you one thing, your grandmother tells you something else, your father tells you something else. And even beyond the family, uh, well, also within the family, not only uncles and, and aunts and grandparents and parents, but older siblings or older cousins, right? The cousin who's been around the block and who knows who's who's uh, had a beer. And so they know uh, they're a little bit more uh, mature and experienced than you are. So they tell you what it's like to be a big kid. So there's all those other voices as well within the family. And then beyond it, your teachers, your pastors, um, neighbors, all those sorts of things, politicians, even people beyond. If we think about our own society, you're not taught how to be a, a girl or a boy just from the people in your life, just from the people you contact, but we see it on TV, in, on, in movies, in books. Those are all ways in which we are instructed, in which we're taught how to behave, how to be a boy or a girl. And as we think of these different voices, these different people telling the girl, do this, don't do that. This is how you behave in this situation. This is how you accomplish this task. We might think, again, back to our own experiences of how do you keep all these different instructions straight in your head? How do you decide if your mother tells you one thing and your father tells you something else? What is the right path? And what does it feel like to have all these different voices trying to teach you how to be? how to behave, how to exist, what to do, how to think. How do, we, uh, how do we manage to construct our own personality, our own individuality from this mass of voices and instructions and rules and examples that is poured into our head from the day we're born? In a sense, it's an impossibility. Right? We can never live up to all the expectations that our parents, our elders put upon us. And we can't follow all the rules because sometimes the rules just conflict with each other. Right? Sometimes uh, one situation you're told this is what you need to do uh, when this happens. This is how you treat a man who, who talks to you in a certain way or whatever it might be. But reality doesn't necessarily always line up with uh, our expectations. So it's impossible to really be this perfect girl. And I think those couple moments where she speaks out, where we see her in uh, the italicized lines where she responds, that's this uh, voice within all of us trying to say, I'm just trying to be me. Um, I, it's, it's hard for me to try to be this person that you want. I can't be the girl you want me to be. I can only be the girl that I am. I can only be the person that I am. Uh, but again, that person is a con construct made out of all these different voices. And somehow something in us reaches out and grabs on to some ideas, some instructions, some beliefs. And that's how we form our own personality, perhaps. Now, also think, though, going back to thinking about the narrator or the narrators, if, um, as I'm suggesting, this isn't just one voice, this isn't just the girl's mother, um, although we might hear that as the dominant voice, but I think also we hear in here the girl's mother, the girl's uh, sisters, the girl's grandmother, the girl's aunts, um, all these other voices, I, I think, are part of this narrative voice. What is it that the narrator values? What are the narrator's concerns? What does the narrator think is important for a girl to know? What does it mean to be a good girl or an ultimately a good woman. Well, notice that a lot of these are about cooking. A lot of these are about cleaning. A lot of these are about domestic chores, managing the household, not entirely in a subservient sense. There's the sense that the, the household is really the, the girl's um, 
arena. It's where the girl has dominance in some sense, or the woman has dominance in some sense, but still there's a restriction to a certain realm of, of life, right? Cooking, cleaning, domestic things. And then we also have these romantic or sexual instructions about how to behave for a man, how to smile, how to, um, uh, how to uh, avoid a man who is, or how to, you know, how to uh, uh, deal with bullying from a man, all those sorts of things. So it's also preparing a woman for the expectation of being a wife and being uh, involved with a man. So there's a certain, certain expectations laid upon the girl that to be a woman means to manage the household, to keep things clean for your husband and family, and to uh, navigate the difficult and complicated interpersonal relationships between men and women. So this is, these are all some of the things that are, uh, that, the, that are important to the narrator. And so while the narrator seems, on the one hand, very bossy, and perhaps even um, a bit uh, overbearing and, and maybe even cruel, given all the um, instructions, and including the insults, don't behave like a slut. I know you're going to become a slut, the narrator says, the slut that you are bent on becoming. Um, the narrator is concerned about that. And the narrator has these values that they're, she's trying to impart because she has experienced these things herself. It's not just even if it's not just the voice of the mother and the grandmother, it's the voice of mothers and grandmothers and other people going back generations. So while this is a very specific story told to one girl in one place, right, the specifics of, of the, the Caribbean details of the narrative make it a very specific story. This isn't just a generic person talking to a generic child. At the same time, it's that specificity, I think, that allows this story to become more universal, allows those of us who weren't born in the Caribbean, who weren't uh, young girls growing up in poverty with an overbearing mother, enables us to understand the experience because we can go through those specific details to get to the deeper, more universal, uh, uh, more common experience beneath, which is the way that rules, the way that expectations cascade down generation after generation and they get modified and changed a little bit but still each generation we are forced to uh, take on this long laundry list of expectations from uh, from our elders from our superiors from our guardians and parents and that that is uh, coming to grips with that is an essential part of becoming a person and and becoming uh, moving from girlhood to womanhood or boyhood to manhood, going from childhood to adulthood, part of it is learning to incorporate and in a way get past those voices and create your own voice out of all the voices that have been poured into your head. And I think what this also tells us is that what it means to be a girl or a boy, these markers that we have, these gender markers of identity, really are what we call social constructions. That is, it's not to say they're imaginary, but as a society, we create expectations and place them upon ourselves and each other. This is what we expect a man to be. This is what we expect a woman to be. And as we're learning today, as many scientists have known for, for a while, but as becoming more um, uh, percolating out into the, the general consciousness is that we're understanding that these identities of gender and sexuality are much more fluid and not as even even the body is uh, not just a binary male female body there's much more um, of a continuum and so this tells us that really you're not born a girl you're not born a boy in a certain sense you have to be made into a girl you have to be made into a boy Society places its, its expectations on you through the vehicle of your parents and your family and your community, and we accept those because we have no other knowledge, we have no other experience, and so we become girls or we become boys. We become the people that are, uh, we try to become the people that we're expected to be, but we, can all, we always fail. No one can ever fully be the perfect girl, the perfect boy. These are fantasies of the woman who fulfills all 
expectations for womanhood, the man who fulfills all expectations for manhood. These are fantasies that don't really exist. And of course, they change over time. Those of you who, who are parents uh, or who are thinking about becoming parents, would you tell your daughters these sorts of things? Is this the kind of instruction that you would give your, your children? Maybe some of these things. I mean, some of it's practical. So if you need to teach your child how to cook, of course you teach them how to cook. But there's a lot of um, social values that are embedded in this, right? The idea, again, that a woman's space, proper place, is the domestic realm. The idea that a woman has to, in some way, serve or provide a service for the men in her life take care of them in a certain way. And the idea that a woman just has to deal with certain um, masculine forms of power and dominance, right? The man that bullies you, um, the baker that uh, uh, will let you feel the bread. Um, all these sorts of things tell us that, you know, becoming a, a girl, becoming a boy, becoming a woman, becoming a man, these are constructed identities that are placed upon us that don't necessarily fit with who we are and who we become. So last thing to say about the story and last thing I'd like you to consider is uh, a couple things. One, how would you write this story from your own experience? What would it be? How, what were you taught about what it means to be a girl or a boy? What were the different voices that were in your life that were placing these expectations on you? And how is it? What do they have in common with what we see here and what's different? That is, how is your experiences, you know, what, what about your experiences um, is radically different from, from the experience of this girl? And what is more similar? What do you share? And I think using both of those to kind of come to an experience, understanding for yourself in your own life of how have you been shaped? What are the voices that have made you into the person that you are? What are the voices that you still hear in your head? We all have those little voices that tell us, oh, you shouldn't do this, or oh my God, your dad would be so mad if he saw you doing this right now, or wouldn't your mom be proud of you right now, right? What are those voices that you hear in the back of your mind that are still placing expectations on you that you're trying to fulfill? Thinking, I think that's one of the, the best things about the story is that it, by putting it in that second person perspective, where we have to both think about being parent and child, or uh, elder and child, and we have to try to occupy both spaces, it not only allows us to understand how we were shaped, and perhaps um, in some ways, you know, many of us had overbearing parents that, that uh, uh, tried to control certain aspects of our lives. And so we understand that not only uh, we can understand that voice and, and hopefully come to some sort of peace with that, but also understand um, why, why our parents and, and elders treated us in a certain way, why they demanded certain things of, of us, what their values were, and understanding that just as you were in the position of the girl or boy being told by your parents and so forth, they were in the position of the girl or boy being told by their parents, and so on and so forth. So keep that in mind as you read this story and think about um, uh, in, in the other stories that we're reading, how is it that they try to tap into some sort of larger, more universal, more common human experience. Because I think that's one of the things that this story does very well. So that's the end of my little uh, spiel on Jamaica Kincaid's Girl. If you have any questions, please send me an email. Um, otherwise, I will see you in the next presentation. I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and take care.